Good morning. I'm so glad you're here. No matter what you're feeling, simply by making the choice to tune in today to worship with us, to make that connection is a choice for life, for love, for hope. It's a choice for the light over against the darkness. So thank you for joining us. It means a lot. And I appreciate it that you're out there. I can see you. I want to remind you that the easiest way you can invite people into the circle of our love is by clicking on share if you're on Facebook. It is our tradition to begin our worship by lighting our Christ candle. And if you have a candle at home, I invite you to do the same. This candle reminds us of the light that shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot overcome. And it sets this time apart as a special time, a sacred time, in which we are intentionally seeking to reach out and open our hearts to the grace of God. Would you join me now in the call to worship? Pilgrims, we are invited to journey through the season of Lent towards the one who calls us each by a new name. Disciples, we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us, pulling our fears, our doubts, our longings behind us. Believers, we seek to trust the God who always surprises us, whose promises take on flesh and blood in the good news called Jesus. And it is that good news that has brought us here. Let us sing now a verse of Be Thou My Vision. Beloved, you are God's child. You are cherished. No matter how the forces of death and darkness, the forces of evil have attacked you this week, uh, leading you to be tempted to be overwhelmed by fear or despair or anger, whatever it is that's got you in its grip, We have gathered in the name of the one who can set us free. And I want to declare to you that your sins are forgiven. And there is a place prepared for you in God's beloved kingdom where there is nothing but love. You are invited to enter into the grace of the Lord. And there is a peace that God gives us through the Holy Spirit through Jesus that enters into our heart even when the world is troubled and it takes down the walls that separate us one from another, from God, from our truest self. Let's claim that peace, shall we? The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Also with you, amen. It's my time for the children and I'm going to take from Terry the clicker. Thank you, Terry. Hey, can you remember when you were two years old? 
the folks in the ear can't. How about you all at home? Have you ever heard the expression, the terrible twos? It's really actually a pretty unfortunate expression because there's really nothing terrible about being two years old. Around the age of two, a child learns a new word, and it becomes their favorite word, and the child tends to use it over and over and over, and it tends to wear on parents. Do you know what word I'm talking about? I happen to have a video here of a real live two-year-old. It's Greg and Susan's beautiful granddaughter, Ada, and she's going to say the word for us. No, no. No, no. Wasn't that wonderful? That's right, the word is no. Parents tend to get annoyed because the two-year-old just loves to say it. But it's actually a very important word. And claiming it is an important part of growing up. By using the word no, it expresses some amazing discoveries. I am my own person. I can stand on my own two feet. I have the freedom to make choices. Now, there are good choices and there are bad choices to make, but the first thing to discover is that you have the power to choose, and that's a very important thing. You remember last week how we talked about the Hebrew people wandering for 40 whole years in the wilderness, learning to say yes to God and no to their fears. They were learning to trust God in their journey to the promised land. Well, one of the things that happened during that time out in the wilderness was that Moses went up on Mount Sinai and God gave Moses ten commandments for the people to follow. Interesting thing about the commandments is that for the most part they are about things people need to get in the habit of saying no to. For instance, God commanded the people to say no to disrespecting their parents. After you've finished being two and having said no a few thousand times, you begin to become confident that you can say no when you need to say it. And at that point, you don't need to say it so much. And maybe around the age of three, you begin to realize that your parents love you very, very much, and they have done so many good things for you, and that, well, it's kind of disrespectful to keep on saying no when they ask you to do something. So, Christopher... Show us the power of saying no. Are you going to disrespect your parents? No. <laughs> Good job, Christopher. God also said not to say no to killing. Roma, are you going to kill? No. Good job, Roma. Of course you're not going to kill. And God told the people to say no to stealing. How about you, Ryan? Are you going to steal? No. <laughs> Good job, Ryan. And how about you, Conrad? No. All right. Good job, Conrad. And God also told us to say no to breaking promises of love we make to people. Promises are important. Austin and Sophia, are you going to do that? No! I love your enthusiasm, Austin and Sophia. 
Another thing that God said is that we weren't supposed to go around telling lies, especially about other people. Michael, are you going to do that? No. Way to go, Michael. And God told us not to spend time wishing we had something that belongs to somebody else. It's called coveting. Julia, are you going to do that? No. There are all different ways to say no. That's wonderful. We say no to all these things so that we can say yes to something else. Being a trustworthy person. Being somebody other people feel safe to be around. Somebody who doesn't disrespect their parents, lie, kill, steal, break promises, covet other people's things or talents. Do you want to be somebody that other people can trust? Somebody other people feel safe around? Yes. 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 Yes! All right. Yes. Yes is a very powerful word, especially when we are free to say no, but we choose to say yes instead. Last week, we also talked about Jesus, who also went out into the wilderness to say no to temptations, to make choices that wouldn't lead him where God wanted him to go. And when he came out of the wilderness, Jesus began telling everybody about God's kingdom of love, where everybody's equal, everybody's cherished, and all are welcome. And he invited people to follow him in pointing to that beautiful kingdom, wherever it can be found right here in this world. So what do you say, Maddie, Abby? And Nikki, do you want to follow Jesus? Yes! That's what I like to hear. Jesus invites us just to dance with him in God's beloved kingdom. So I hope you will think about the power of saying no and the power of saying yes. And one way we can say yes is by spending time with God in prayer. I keep reminding you of this every week. Do you have a prayer chair? Have you sit, sat in that chair and just sort of let yourself be with God, saying, yes, God? I invite you to think about that. And what is it we always say at the end of our time together? There's always room in the circle. And now we are going to have an anthem by our beloved Daryl, bringing us some country gospel that we can worship the Lord together. One for higher education, two 
them were searching for lost souls That driver never ever saw the stop sign Eighteen wheelers can't stop on a dime There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway Why there's not four of them, heaven only knows Yes, it's not what you take when you leave this world behind you What you leave behind you when you go that farmer left a harvest, a home in 80 acres. Faith and love for growing things in his young son's heart. That teacher left her wisdom in the minds of lots of children. Did her best to give them all a better start. That preacher whispered, can't you see the promised land? Leave that blood-stained Bible in the hooker's hand There are three wooden crosses on the right side of the highway Why there's not four of them, heaven only knows Yes, it's not what you take when you leave this world behind you It's what you leave behind you when you go that's a story that our preacher told last Sunday As he held that blood-stained Bible up for all of us to see He said, bless the farmer and the teacher and the preacher Gave his Bible to my mama who read it to me There are on the right side of the highway Why there's not four of them Now I guess we know It's not what you take When you leave this world behind you It's what you leave behind you when you go There are three wood crosses On the right side of the highway Am I on now? Thank you, Daryl. There's a tie-in to my sermon and what he's saying. See if you can find it. So this is the time in this, our service where we would be having our offering if we were all together offering our gifts of gratitude to the Lord. And I want to express my sincere gratitude to all the support that so many of you have offered financially to support this very, very critical ministry that we share as a church. In these difficult, difficult times, we offer hope. We offer the gospel of love that includes everybody, the love that Jesus revealed to us. And so I thank you for your prayers. I thank you for your gifts. You can send your offerings to the church by mail, or you can go to PayPal at our website. Whatever you do, we appreciate your support. And thank you for those who have stepped up and gave more, given more in awareness that there are some among us who just can't give hardly any now because they've lost their income and struggling so. So, we're in the Gospel of Mark, and the lesson we have this morning comes midway through the Gospel, 
And it represents this pivotal turning point in the story. Up until this point in the gospel, Jesus' whole ministry has been in the northern country of Galilee, which is some distance away from Jerusalem and the temple there, which is down in the southern region. He's been wandering about Galilee, and for the most part, except for the fact that he seems to have upset a lot of religious authorities, his ministry seems to have been incredibly successful. He's got thousands of people coming wherever he is to try to get close to him. They're really impressed by his healing powers and his ability to cast out the evil spirits that oppress people. They're just amazed by his authority with which he speaks. And yet there's been this interesting thing that along this whole period of time, Jesus has not once spoken about his true identity. However, in the passage immediately before the one we're about to hear, Jesus has finally raised up the question about his identity. He has asked his disciples in a private moment, who do people say that I am? And they've said, well, you're some kind of prophet. They they clearly know that God is, that Jesus come from God. And then he puts them on the spot. But who do you say that I am? And Old Peter, who's always kind of impulsive and ready to speak, who perhaps without a whole lot of thought, says, you are the Messiah. The Greek word is Christos, Christ. You are the Christ. And curiously, Jesus seems to accept that answer as the right one, but he says to them, don't tell anyone about this which is strange. From this point forward, Jesus will be making his way towards the cross. The passage I'm about to read includes some of the most important verses in terms of understanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what the spiritual journey that we're all called to be about is really involves. And the verses are, I would say, more often than not misunderstood. So I want to take some time, verse by verse. It begins in the 31st verse of the 8th chapter. Listen for the word of the Lord. Terry, would you click? Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man, uh, the humble title that Jesus seems to have preferred when speaking about himself, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, those were the ones who administered the temple in Jerusalem, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said this all quite openly. As you can imagine, the disciples were absolutely stunned. Jesus is saying that in obedience to God, he is freely choosing to go to the power center of their nation, the temple in Jerusalem, confront the religious authorities who have essentially taken, been taken hold of by the power of evil and have been oppressing people rather than being instruments of God's love. He's going to confront them with the truth, but he's not going to confront them with the powers that we're familiar with in this world, that is to say violence the violence of military might, but rather by the power of his spiritual authority and divine love, which in this instance means sacrificial love. He knows that the religious authorities will not let go of their tight grip on power. 
that they will conspire to have him killed. But he will allow himself to be murdered in this most cruel manner. He concludes by mentioning his resurrection. But the disciples seem to be so blown away by the part about the suffering and the death that that doesn't even seem to register. Impulsive, outspoken Peter takes the lead in responding to the bombshell. Terry? And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind on the not on divine things, but on human things. Wow. That's pretty much the harshest thing that Jesus ever said to an individual at any point in the Gospels. Calling Peter, like the central disciple, Satan. And Peter represents you and me. Peter represents the church, which is a humbling reminder that the struggle between good and evil, between serving God and taking Jesus' path and serving the world in its fashion of distortion are quite at odds. It's a reminder that we often don't know what we're doing. Terry? Jesus called the crowd with his disciples. So apparently he wanted all the people who were considering being his disciples to hear what he wanted to say next. And he said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow me. There's some pretty harsh, distinctly unappealing words here. Terry, deny yourself and take up your cross. When misunderstood, these words, A, have often led Christians to be a distinctly joyless, unappealing lot. And B, turned a lot of people off from taking Jesus seriously, which is most unfortunate. So I want to try and get at what I think Jesus is saying with these harsh words But first I want to take note of the words that come right before and after the harsh words. Terry? If anyone wants to be my follower, comes before, and follow me, comes after. Which is to say, the harsh words are sandwiched between something very positive, something very wonderful. Jesus is inviting you and me to go with him on a very great adventure. He's calling us to embrace a high and holy purpose in life. Eighty years ago, the famous psychiatrist Carl Jung, who was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud, but differed from him in that he truly appreciated the spiritual life, made a comment that the great majority of his patients who came to see him seeking help suffered from the fact, after the age of 30, that they were ailing at the deepest level with a loss of meaning in life. They had lost touch with that depth of life with purpose that great religious traditions at their best offer, a holy, sacred purpose to our lives. But back to those harsh words, Terry. First, deny yourself. 
When you or I think about ourselves, what exactly are we talking about? On the surface, that seems like a silly question, a simple question. I'm me, of course. But I would suggest that it's not quite that simple. There is a little you that lives with perpetual anxiety and a desire to be in control, habitually seeking to put itself at the center of everything. This little self has endless desires that it clamors to have met, desires typically encouraged by the world. This little self instinctively avoids pain. Sometimes this little self is referred to as the ego, but that's not exactly the right word because a strong ego is a good thing. And when a little child learns the power of saying no, what they are doing in part is building a strong ego. The capacity to speak for oneself and to stand on one's own two feet. And that's a good thing. But possessing a strong ego isn't the end point of the spiritual journey, though often people mistakenly think that it is. Which is why Jung said that thing about his patience over the age of 30. The longer we live, if we're paying attention, we begin to realize that having a strong ego isn't enough. The question arises, for what purpose will my ego live? And deeper down beyond that little anxious, grasping self, there is another you that is often referred to as the soul or the true self. The world doesn't tend to give a lot of attention to this deeper self, viewing it, viewing us primarily as consumers, and as such focuses on that little shallow self instead. If we're doing what the church is intended to do, we are helping one another get in touch with that deeper self, that reality, that mystery called the soul, the self that is connected to God. So when Jesus speaks of denying yourself, he's addressing that constant, clamoring, shallow self. It has all these desires encouraged by the world, and yet the strange thing is that when this little self manages to satisfy one of these longed-for desires, the happiness is fleeting at best, and other desires quickly capture the little self's attention as the new must-have key to happiness. Jesus is talking about choosing to say no to this shallow self's attempt to define what our lives will be all about. Terry? And now that other harsh part of what Jesus said, take up your cross. That sounds pretty morbid. But the truth is that life unavoidably involves suffering. It comes in a whole variety of forms. We can try to run from it, or we can embrace it. Running from it doesn't end, doesn't work in the end. And there's a particular form of suffering that Jesus is referring to when he talks about taking up your cross, and that is the suffering that is the unavoidable consequence of truly loving in this world. It's the pain of compassion when we allow ourselves to feel the pain of other people. It's the pain of grief when we lose somebody we've loved. The expression hardening our hearts 
refers to this refusal to take up the cross of suffering that comes with love. Essentially, keeping us from living out the love for which we were created. Terry? And Jesus continues, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Now these words make absolutely no sense unless we keep in mind that there are two different cells at play inside of all of us. The shallow, anxious, clutching self and that deeper self we commonly call the soul. Attempting to save one's life, as Jesus is speaking of it, refers to that shallow, little self. It's living by the lies the world has encouraged for us to set our hearts on. Basically, if I can create a fortress of safety where my little self can get all those things it desires, I will achieve happiness. That's kind of the lie in a nutshell. And losing your life for the sake of Jesus in the gospel involves saying no to these lies so that we can say yes to what truly matters, which is essentially love and its myriad expressions. The no's, we say, make it possible to say yes as a beloved child of God to a deeper, richer kind of life, kingdom of God life. Isn't that right? Yes! Again? Thank you. Abby, Maddie, and Nikki. And Jesus continues, For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life, their soul? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life, their soul? Which is to say that when we make a habit of living life out of that little shallow self, there is this distinct danger that we will lose our deeper self, the mystery that we call our soul, the capacity to give and receive love, the capacity to feel ourselves caught up in a high and holy purpose, a great adventure that is much larger than ourselves. So Lent is a season in which we give particular attention to something we actually should be giving attention to the entire year, which is the health of our souls. These words of Jesus suggest that the spiritual life is about learning where to say no and where to say yes in our lives. Finding answers to these questions is a challenge because, as one spiritual writer put it, there are no dittos when it comes to souls. No two souls are exactly alike. We are all unique. And that's because, A, we have been given different gifts and weaknesses, and B, we've all been planted in a different environment. But let me throw out a few no's and a few yeses for you to contemplate in regard to your own spiritual journey. Saying no to constantly needing the approval of others to validate your sense of worth. And saying yes to the love from God that gives you infinite worth. Saying no to talking so much and saying yes to listening more and experiencing the awe of the mystery of other people and the world of nature and the mystery of ourselves. Or conversely, 
saying no to hiding your light under a, a bushel and saying yes to claiming your own true God-given voice. Saying no to the voice inside you that the world has taught you that your body is ugly. And saying yes to the miracle of having a body that can see and hear and feel and taste and smell all the beauty there is in this world. Saying no to another voice the world has planted inside us that tells us that we need more and more of the stuff that the world defines as markers of status and saying yes instead to generosity and traveling light. Saying no to harboring resentments and bitterness and saying yes to the preciousness of the life we were given to share with others. Saying no to the compulsive need to be right and win arguments and yes to the love that binds us all together. Saying no to the fear of failure and saying yes to taking risks of love and creativity, knowing that God will hold us if we stumble. Saying no to worrying about being successful. And yes, to the simple call of being faithful. Saying no to the anxious need for control and safety, and yes, to joining Jesus in the great adventure of witnessing to the kingdom of God breaking into this world right here, right now. Saying no to the paralyzing fear of death, and saying yes to the resurrection power of God that will hold us in death so that we can live our life abundantly. Please pray with me. Help us, O oh Lord, to follow Jesus. Help us to find the places in our life where we need to say yes and where we need to say no to make room for that yes. Help us to listen for your still small voice guiding us as we make our way through the darkness. Help us, O oh Lord, to live in your love. We ask this all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So let us sing a verse of I have decided to follow Jesus. And so it is our time to pray together. And Jesus taught us to pray, taught us to reach out to God with all that's inside of us, trusting that in the process of reaching out to God in prayer, there's a transformation that takes place inside of us, that what concerns us begins to change and begin to focus more on what it is God is calling us towards. I pray that as we pray together, that's what will happen for all of us. There will be opportunity, again, for you to share your joys, 
by texting them. And there'll also be a time where I stop and we all pray for that place of our deepest need. And then there'll be another place where I'll pause and we'll share our concerns for prayer. And you're invited to text those as well. Please join me now in prayer. Oh God, you know how it is with us. You know us vastly better than we know ourselves. You know how easy it is for us to get lost, to be like that wandering lost sheep in the wilderness who's forgotten who we are. But we have gathered here together this morning that we might come home, that we might touch again the reality of our souls and that deep, eternal connection we have with you and one another. Help us, O Lord, to open up our hearts and our minds to your spirit, to make room for your love. Help us in this time of stillness this time of prayer to welcome the gratitude that might be arising within us, the awareness that we have been blessed in spite of all our troubles, that our cup runneth over in spite of all the adversity, the awareness that your light shines in spite of all the darkness. Help us, O Lord, to claim the ways in which you have shown your love to us, you have blessed us. Help us, O Lord, to awaken the grateful heart. We have in this past year, O Lord, come to appreciate so many things we have come to take for granted. Our need for one another, our need to touch one another and be in one another's presence. We thank you for the gift of people who have loved us, people who have carried us in our times of despair, where our faith seemed to be buried, dormant, disappeared. We thank you for those who've encouraged us, who've reached out to us. We thank you for those who've challenged us. We thank you for those who have forgiven us. And we thank you in turn for those spaces you have opened up for us to express love for the people you've given us in our lives to care for. We thank you, O Lord, for your spirit that has nudged us to look out beyond ourselves, our homes, our families, to care about others in the larger community. We thank you for music. We thank you for the beauty of the earth. We thank you for little children. We thank you for those who've lived many years on this earth. And by intentionally embracing the call to follow you, have come to shine a great light. We thank you for all the courage that we have witnessed, both near and far, in the midst of these difficult times. We thank you for those who've witnessed to a greater justice. We pray a prayer of thanksgiving for the gift of our church, for the gospel that we proclaim, the faith we carry for one another in your love that is greater than all the powers of death and darkness that would oppress us. We thank you, O Lord, for the mystery of your spirit at work in our lives, even when we cannot see it, acknowledge it. 
Lord, in your goodness, hear our prayers. Mom and I are grateful that we were able to get to, um, to our vaccination appointment on Monday during that s snowstorm. Um, Mom was a real trooper. <laughs> she hung in there being pushed in a little wheelchair through the snow. Um, so we're very thankful for that. Um, Tim Tyler is thankful for the most part, he says, to be back up and out and about after his surgery. Barbara Christofferson says, thank you for the prayers for her father-in-law. He is improving and is home from the hospital. Please continue prayers of healing. Betty Poland is grateful that her surgery on Tuesday went well. Thank you all for your prayers and kind wishes. Meadie is thankful that they got three offers on her old house. Prayers that God will reveal the path to follow. We thank you, God, for these blessings and for so many more that go unnamed. Thank you for your wondrous love that works in quiet ways like seeds buried in the earth, buried in our hearts. Give us eyes, O Lord, to see the signs of your kingdom breaking forth with abundant love in the midst of our broken world. And we would confess to you our brokenness individually. You know each of us, O oh Lord, the struggles we have had, the burdens we have carried, the things that have kept us awake at night, the ways in which we are held in bondage and not able to live fully the glorious liberty of your beloved children, the things that have blocked our capacity to love and to experience joy. You know us, O oh Lord. And so in this moment of silence, we would invite for that same spirit that descended upon Jesus when he was baptized by John, that set the captives free, that that same Jesus, that same spirit, would touch us in that place of our deepest need, trusting that you know us better than we know ourselves. Come, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you, perhaps, for a little shift that took place in some of us during that time of silence, a letting go, a deeper trust, an awareness that your love is moving through our lives, even when we can't see it. And you have called us to pray for this broken world and for the needs of people. You've placed them upon our hearts. We feel your compassion for them. We don't understand this mystery that is prayer, but we trust that your spirit works through our prayers to bring light where there is darkness. And so we raise up into your arms those concerns we have, we pray for those who are still struggling after the winter storm and the power outages that struck Texas. We pray for our beloved Charlie Kinsley, who unfortunately yesterday had to go back into the hospital after having moved to a rehab because of pressure in his chest and now is in the ICU of St. Clair's Hospital. Lord, bathe him in your light and bless his son's 
David and Danny, and their concern for their beloved dad. We pray for Penny's Aunt Marion, who is in a rehab facility recovering from two strokes. We pray for Ben Weintraub, who has been suffering from two herniated discs, and tomorrow very early will go into New York to come under the knife of a surgeon. We ask your peace to be with Ben and his wife and son, and for your spirit to guide the hand of the surgeon. We pray for Anna and Barb's friend Claire. In her grief and sadness for her husband Norman, who seems to be in the valley of the shadow, we pray for the ongoing needs of Anna Crystal and Betsy Adams. For June and Wes and Lynn Bostwick and Wah and Hetal and Ann Saunders and Amina and Cheryl's sister Susan and, Cheryl and Angela and Jim and Barbara Simmons and the Wentz family. We pray for Heather Bryant's child within her womb for her pregnancy. We pray for all those who are dealing with cancer. We thank you for Barbara Christofferson's encouraging words about her father-in-law. We're grateful for Betty and Tim for their successful procedures this week. We pray for Jean Monteculo's dear friend, Ellie, who recently was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer with a difficult road ahead. We pray for Pauline's friend, Ron, in California, who's had a return of cancer that has spread through his body. For Arlene Sklow's Uncle John and Tim's Uncle Bill. For Dave Kensley's birth mother, Darlis. For Carol Korob and John Houghton and Anna Weiss's sister-in-law, Norma. For my friend, Dave Roundsville. For Renee's husband, Bob, and Len Chris's friend, Chris, who's facing her third round of cancer and chosen not to receive chemo. Bless her. We pray for all who are grieving, including Lincoln Ferris, as he grieves for his wife, Terry, and for Terry's daughters, Rosemary and Lisa. We pray for our beloved Lynn Ager, grieving for her mother, for Gina and Nick, for the Weiss family, for Connie, Jonathan, and Michael, for Garrett's sister, Andrea. We pray for those who are late in the journey of their life, dealing with the frailty of their bodies, especially Charlie Fallon and Doris and Fred and Lori Wilkins' mom and Carolyn's dad with early onset dementia, Tom's mother, Betsy O'Grady's dad, Paul Adams' parents, Dominic's mother, Greg's mom, Renee's mom, for Eric Christiango's mom, grateful that she has come home from the hospital, for my father and stepmother, we pray for all who continue to battle with COVID. We pray for your healing to be with those who are dealing with the after effects, including my brother-in-law, Bobby, in Michigan. We pray for the medical staff who have been such heroes this past year in their exhaustion. We ask a blessing upon them pray a prayer of thanksgiving for those who have worked to bring the vaccinations and those who have organized the delivery of the vaccinations and ask that they may continue to be made available to more and more people. 
We pray for all of us with weakened immune systems. And we pray for mindfulness on the part of each of us about the impact that we have on one another, both physically and spiritually. We pray for students of all ages struggling to continue to learn in these difficult times and for teachers and parents and administrators dealing with all the confusion and frustration. We pray especially for children with disabilities and attention deficits. We pray for those living in institutions who are particularly vulnerable in this pandemic, including Michael Krissa, Tommy Bramley, Edward Kogan, TJ Kogan, Susan's sister, Helen, Paul's brother, Doug, Carolyn's sister, Beverly, Amy Deke's mother and Dawn's dad, Anna's mother, Muriel, and June Snetzer's mom, and our beloved sister, Diane Morgan. We pray for all in the valley of the shadow. We pray for all who are struggling with loneliness, for families under stress, for those who are experiencing depression and the temptations of despair and darkness, for all those dealing with psychiatric illnesses, and for those who've lost jobs and perhaps businesses, for those seeking, for those who are facing eviction and seeking homes, including Gina and Nick. We pray for all who are seeking jobs. We pray for reconciliation in our society. We pray for healing where relationships have been broken over disagreements about politics. We pray for the capacity to honor the inherent sacred worth of every single person. We pray for our damaged earth and the web of life connecting every living creature. For we pray for all of your little ones, O oh Jesus, throughout the world's suffering, the refugees, the homeless, the orphans. We pray that we might learn the things that make for peace, that each of us might turn away from violence in all of its different forms. We pray for courage and wisdom and responsibility for persons with, in places of authority and for each of us and whatever authority we have been given to be faithful. <clears throat> Lord, in your mercy. In our prayers. <clears throat> Amy Deeks has prayers for Karen Gregory to feel better soon. She has serious health issues that put her in the hospital last week and is now home. Prayers for Michelle, Michelle's mom and dad and continue getting better. Prayers that Amy finds a job soon again. Kayla Christofferson asked prayers for her friend Ruthie and her family and sh as she is dealing with the loss of her father this week. Also prayers for Kayla as, and her roommate as her roommate tested positive for COVID. Mady asked prayers for her friend Kristen whose father has cancer and is not doing well. Joanne asked prayers for a good conversation hope maybe tomorrow with her former boss at Morris Knowles as she asks about future part-time work. Amy Deeks asks prayers for Donna. She has been having health issues. Make, please make her okay. Prayers for William Benento and Jen to have peace in the loss of their dog. Anna Weiss asks prayers for the family of Eleanor Moretti Murata, a dear friend since their early teen years. She passed away Thursday from COVID pneumonia. She was one of 11 children and will be missed by so many. Betsy Adams asked prayers for their daughter, Nicole, who was finishing up her postdoc and is looking for a job.
We hand to you, O Lord, these concerns, trusting that you hold each of these people in your love. You cherish them, and you are at work in their lives. We ask, finally, simply for the courage to be faithful to you, to love even when it's difficult, to forgive, to speak the truth, to be humble and recognize when we don't know what is true. to be a community that can witness to this world the nature of love, the nature of your love, O Lord, the nature of your hope that cannot die, the nature of the good news of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And let us finish up now with the final two verses of Be Thou My Vision. I want to thank you so for being with us today. Just by tuning in, it helps turn us a little bit towards the light and away from the darkness. There will come a time when we will be able to have coffee hour in person hosted by Tom and Catherine and Jean, but that time has not been reached yet. It's now not as far away as it once was, but we still have some waiting to do. Those who've been asking, we are trying to figure out when it will be safe and how to be safe to begin to have people back in the sanctuary on Sunday morning. Nonetheless, there continue to be ways for us to connect from a distance. On Monday and Tuesday, Joanne hosts a session on Zoom at noon for people to gather and connect And on Friday, Betsy does the same. On Wednesday and Thursday, I am leading on Zoom a guided meditation. I lead people into a place of stillness as we open ourselves to the healing and blessing power of Jesus in our lives. People find it helpful in this time of stress, and people who are seeking healing find it helpful. There's two opportunities for Bible study this week. There is a Bible study on Wednesday. The United Methodist women are having a Bible study. Uh, It's called The Burden of Blame. It has to do with Eve. It's uh, on Zoom. And if you are not a part of uh, the email list that 
would, Betsy has, you are invited to reach out to Betsy or reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with Betsy so you can get yourself a Zoom invite to be a part of that Bible study Wednesday evening. <clears throat> and on Thursday, <clears throat> we continue our in-depth study of the Gospel of Mark that we have been preaching about, listening to on Sunday mornings. Uh, that's at 7 o'clock for an hour. Uh, even, even if you haven't been coming to any of them, you're welcome to join in. There's room, and we do a review before we move on. Once again, I want to make sure that if you are, have a compromised immune system and haven't gotten fully vaccinated, uh, and there are people here who are glad to help you go shop, run errands for you, so just let us know. If you are suffering from a shortage of food, our township has a food drop on Fridays that you don't even have to register for, you just have to show up. Uh, you can find more about it online at, at our township's website. And finally, I want to thank you again for your pledges of support and all the ways that you express your care and support through prayers and your offerings. It means so much. Have I forgotten anything? Thank you, team, Barb, Terry, Connie, Daryl, for being the unseen presence here that has made this possible. And now, let us have our benediction. We would follow you, O oh Jesus. We would go forth into this world as those who bear your light and peace. We would go forth into this world humbly, recognizing that we will stumble and that we have our own darkness to examine. But we will go into this world trusting your promise to use us in all our frailties to witness to your beloved kingdom of light and love where all are welcome breaking into this world even now. Let us go together in your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.